myself stood in the middle of them and said to them, Peace to you. I'm sorry, I got in the wrong spot.
I'm going to speak before. I'm actually going to take a moment and uh, start out with prayer. If you guys don't mind, bowing your heads one more time with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you know, I feel unworthy to share a message as great as Jesus. And Father, I ask that you speak through me, have your words, be my words. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. So over my last few sermons, We've looked at 1 John, and I'm going to put a pause on that for this communion week. Today I want to look at the last few hours of Jesus' life, his sacrifice for each of you. This is an important part of communion, and combined with this quote that I read last time, let me read it again, it's from Desire of Ages, page 83, Does everyone have a paper this Sabbath? Does anyone? No one has a paper. They're right there, I think, next to you, Blake. Someone's coming to hand them out. There we go. If you, we'll get them all handed out. But from the Desire of Ages, page 83, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in the contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penance and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Friends, I believe it's in this reflection, this time of using our imagination to look at each scene, that we will see the cost of our sin. We get to see the love of God and know Him more. And that's what communion is. It's a reflection on that gift. We are to do this in remembrance of Jesus. Today, I'm going to go through a lot of... I'm actually, you can see it at the top of your study guides. We're going to look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I might not quote them all, but I this week literally took all three accounts of those last few hours and put them in order and then jammed in the desire of ages. And so I'm not going to quote or read you that whole paper I put together, but what I am going to do is try to tell it in a story, but there are a couple desire of ages quotes I want to read and a couple scripture quotes I want to read as we go through that. And I would ask as we talk through that, that you let your imagination grasp those scenes that you think of that great love that Jesus, that God, has for each of you. And what a story it is. Now, I would encourage you to go back and read. It's chapter 78 and 79 and the four gospel accounts, but if you're too busy and you drive a lot, you can scan this. I'll put this up again at the very, very end of service. There's an organization called Audioverse, and what they've done is they've created eight days where they read you those Desire of Ages key places, and they help you spend time each day reflecting. They'll send you an email once a day for eight days, and you can listen to those closing scenes. So Jesus, the Son of God, took on humanity. It wasn't to rule here on earth like many thought, but it was to pave a path for you, for me. 
It is to put us back into atonement with Him and His Father. Now, how did we treat this man who should have been our king? Now, as we dwell on this amazing gift, it is important to understand all he went through. You see, it was after the Passover supper, Jesus had neither food nor drink. He was mentally worn down from his conflict with Satan in the garden. He had taken the cup of our sins, and that was bearing down on him already. He had been betrayed by Judas, but not just Judas, none of his friends, none of his disciples stood by him. Jesus was passed from leader to leader, a farce of a trial at night where he was sentenced to death. Jesus had been insulted, he had been mocked, he had been tortured by whip. His back was filleted open. And yet, he never spoke a word that didn't glorify God. Jesus was entering the worst, most brutal death man could imagine. And he was tired, he was hungry, mentally exhausted, physically beaten near death, and he was covered with your sin. A sin that had separated him from his father. After all of that, they jested as they clothed him in royal clothing of purple. They jammed a crown of thorns upon his head. Jesus, the king of the universe, God became man. Deserving of every earthly blessing, every earthly honor we could give, is here on earth to save you. And in return, Jesus is standing there, back bleeding. Wounds, puncture wounds in his head. And as he stands there, they mockingly salute him. Hail the king of the Jews! They hit him in the head. They spit on him and mockingly bow before him. He is stripped of his mock royal clothes. And the instrument of his torture, the cross, is laid upon him. This understandably becomes more than his human nature can bear. Jesus, our Savior, fell underneath that burden. Even though there was a crowd gathered to watch, no one seemed to care. They loaded him up again, and again he collapses under that strain. You know, the saddest thing is there was a group of Jews around him. None of them stood up to help him. These were his people. But they were worried, we're told in spirit of prophecy, that they would defile themselves for the Passover. How ironic it is that the one, the lamb they were trying to honor in Passover, standing before them, they weren't willing to offer a finger to help. The true lamb of God. The ceremony had become more important than the true. Fortunately, a man named Simeon, Simon, sorry, happened to be passing by. His sons were told were believers, but he was not at that time. Even so, he took the cross. We're told he was forever after grateful for this opportunity. Carrying this cross became a gift that he was ever cheerful to continue to bear that burden. Now, as was always the case with Jesus, God's character couldn't help but come through. Through, Though he was suffering under physical and emotional strain, 
he spotted the women in the crowd mourning him. You see, even while bearing their sins, your sins, his heart burned for others around him. He knew that they were not sad because of who he was. They were sad and pitying the pain of his human condition. Jesus at that moment, though, saw forward to the destruction of Jerusalem. And in his heart, he had deep sympathy for what these people were going to go through. With Simon bearing the weight of the cross and Jesus bearing your sins, they finally arrived at Golgotha, the place of his execution. The crowd gathers around. Jesus' mother and at least a few of the disciples were there. However, they were puzzled. Why would Jesus allow this? Had they made a mistake? the one that they thought was the Savior, the one that would come and save them and take the throne, the one that had healed the sick. Why was he allowing this to happen? Now, as the other criminals were placed on their crosses, they wrestled and fought to escape. But we're told Jesus made no resistance. And as that hammer fell, nailing our Savior to the cross, making scars he still has today, the scars that bear witness to the enormity of the love Jesus has for you. We're told Mary couldn't take it anymore. She had to leave. The sight, the sound was just too much for her human heart. So John took Mary away from the scene. As the soldiers continued to nail him to the cross, Jesus' prayer is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What's interesting and what's amazing is while this was a prayer for those doing the unthinkable acts in this moment, that prayer is for you. His pain wasn't just physical pain. The pain that was really hurting him was the weight of your sins. Desire of Ages 745. That prayer of Christ for his enemies embraced the world. It took in every sinner that had lived or should live from the beginning of the world to the end of the time. That's for you. Upon all rests the guilt of crucifying the Son of God. You know, I'll pause. Sometimes we think, how dare they? I would never have done that. Friends, We know Jesus didn't die from the cross. He died from the weight of our sin. It is us that crucified our Lord. Continuing to all, forgiveness is freely offered. Hallelujah. Whosoever will may have peace with God and inherit eternal life. Praise God. You see, Jesus was thinking about you in that very moment. The thing that killed Jesus was not the torture, but it was the enormity of sin, the separation from the Father. And while taking on your sins, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As they lifted him up, even his clothes are up for grabs. The soldiers gamble. There's no dignity, no honor. And you can sense Jesus is beginning to feel all alone. The crowd looked on. 
the ruler sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. Through all of this, our Savior made no complaint. His face was calm and serene while great drops of sweat rested upon his brow. There was no pitying hand that came to wipe it away. No words of kindness, no words of sympathy. Had the soldiers known who they were putting to death, the guilt would have become unbearable. And yet some later came to see their sin. Repent and be converted. That is the power of our God. Through all of this, the pain and suffering, God's purpose was almost complete. Jesus the Lamb would soon become the advocate of man. You see, God had spoken at Jesus' baptism, yet now heaven almost seems silent. Jesus hanging on the cross felt utterly alone. The crowd was unrelenting, mocking him by quoting, you who destroy the temple and build it up in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. There Jesus hung, while priests, rulers, and scribes, all supposed to be leaders, pointing to him, pointing to his glory, pointing to the Lamb of God, led the mob in mocking him. Nailed above him was a sign that read, The King of the Jews. It's interesting, we are told that this was actually a heaven-inspired message. God had guided the hand that wrote out this truth. The king of the Jews. The king of you and me. How many would read that sign? How far would that message travel? How would the stories be told? Jesus continued to hang there, feeling alone looking for a gleam of comfort. And sadly, it wasn't from a friend or kindness from some religious leader. It came from the criminal hanging next to him. He had actually seen Jesus before. His heart had moved when he heard Jesus speak. He had become convicted that Jesus was the Christ. But then he heard the rulers and the priests talk. And they talked against this Jesus. And so he tucked that conviction away and dove, we're told, back into sin even harder. It wasn't until this hardened criminal had done so much, he was sentenced to death. Little did he know, he got to the judgment hall. He heard Pilate speak. I find nothing in this man. He heard that of Jesus. He saw Jesus' God-like character, we're told. He heard Jesus' prayer. Father, forgive him. His heart stirred anew. It's amazing. Jesus all alone, his friends not standing for him, no one standing, and the one gleam of hope comes from a man who's sentenced to death for things he had done, a death he probably deserved. That is his gleam. What's amazing about that part of the story is if you've ever felt like, God, I've done too much, There's a thief on the cross that would testify otherwise. The greatness, the goodness, the love of the Father and Son. We all know that this time, this thief is thankful that he didn't push this conviction aside this time. 
Let me read Luke 23, 39 through 42. Then one of the criminals who were, who were hanged blasphemed against him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You see, this was a light of hope to Jesus. He allows Jesus in. And what's amazing is instantly it seems to change him. We've talked about that flashlight, that light of God that comes into us. There is no such thing as a dark, flash dark, I always mess that up, but there is only the light of Christ. He opened up the thief, let that light shine on his life, and he was changed. Desire of Ages 750. With longing heart, he has listened for some expression of faith from his disciples. He has heard only the mournful words. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. I'll let you read the rest of that quote later. But how sad. With longing heart... He listened. He wanted to hear something from his disciples. His companions, yet they only spoke mournful words. It was a stranger, a criminal next to, to him that gave the gleam of hope for Jesus. Now I'd ask, how about you? He is listening. He's listening for expressions of faith from you. Are you like the thief, or are there times when you only speak mournful words? Friends, I'll tell you, Jesus is standing at your heart's door, knocking. He is waiting. He is waiting with longing desire to enter. Desire of Ages, 751. The bystanders caught the words of the thief called the thief and called Lord when he called Lord Jesus. The tone of the repentant man arrested their attention. Those who were at the foot of the cross had been quarreling over Christ's garments and casting lots upon his vesture. They stopped to listen. Their angry tones were hushed. With bated breath, they looked upon Christ and waited for the response from the dying lips. What an impact do words have on others? How many later came to believe in Jesus because the faith that had been shown by the thief and the love that had been shown by Christ? Luke 23, 43 reads, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. You see, Jesus, he had all the power in heaven. He allowed this to happen for you. Jesus heard every word as the priest declared, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Was coming down from the cross in Jesus' power? You better believe it. He had the armies of heaven were waiting to come rescue the Savior. We're told that. Yet he sits there on the cross for you. He hung there 
feeling alone due to the weight of our sins, being mocked by people he was trying to save. Desire of Ages 752. With amazement, the angels beheld the infinite love of Jesus, who suffering the most intense agony of mind and body and thought only of others encouraged the penitent soul to believe. In his humiliation, he as a prophet had addressed the daughters of Jerusalem. As a priest and advocate, he had pleaded with the Father to forgive his murderers, and as a loving Savior, he had forgiven the sins of the penitent thief. Friends, this, this is the God I serve. How about you? He, in his worst moment, when we are the ones pushing him down, he turns to minister to us and love us. Jesus, in the midst of all of this, he forgives you. What an amazing love. What amazing grace. Jesus, nearing the end of his life here, he scans the crowd gathered, seeing the one he looked for, Mary. You see, earlier we said she had left, but John knew Jesus' time was short and had brought Mary back. Jesus, looking into her grief-stricken face, and then upon John, he said to her, Woman, Behold thy son. And then to John, behold thy mother. John understood Christ's words and accepted the trust. He at once took Mary to his home and from that hour cared for her tenderly. But what care did Jesus have in his dying moment? His concern was the suffering of his mother. And then darkness fell over the land, and Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But why the question? What is happening? Did God really leave Jesus? You see, our ransom was not afraid of dying. It wasn't the pain that made him call out, but it was as the Desire of Ages reads, page 752, but his suffering was from a sense of the malignity of sin, a knowledge that through familiarity with evil, man had become blinded to its enormity. Christ saw how deep the hold of sin upon the human heart and how few would be willing to break from its power. He knew that without help from God, humanity must perish, and he saw the multitudes perishing within reach of abundant help. We have talked week after week. Jesus is standing there at the cliff's edge reaching for you. Friends, he wants to save each and every one of us. Are we willing to give it to him? In this moment, at the end of Jesus' life, his concern, his worry is for you. He is sad that sin has such a hold on humanity. Jesus felt alone, but it is actually deeper than that. Continuing the quote, But now, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. Imagine! Jesus, who had felt such a connection with the Father throughout his whole life, suddenly separated by sin. The withdrawal of divine continence from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that, we can, ne or that can never be fully understood by man. So great was his agony that the physical pain was hardly felt. Think about that for a minute. Jesus longed to see his father's face. 
but it's the sorrow that we will never understand. And we always see, I mean, even in the, there's been movies and all sorts of stuff, focus so intently on the physical pain, right? But it's telling us here, that was hardly even felt over his breaking heart. We almost cringe at the thought of the things Jesus went through physically. I don't think, well, it tells us we will never understand what Jesus really went through. Same page of Desire of Ages. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Christ, of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Do you get that? He didn't see a way that he was going to live through this. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave as a conqueror. He thought he was going to fail or tell him of the Father's acceptance of his sacrifice. He wasn't even sure that his Father would take his sacrifice for us. His heart was being tortured by Satan through this sin. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation would be eternal. Do you see what Jesus is going through at this moment right here? He wasn't sure his mission would be successful. And if it was, he wasn't sure he would ever have a connection with his father again. Now I have a question for you. If you had an access to the armies of heaven that could pull you off off that cross with this temptation, would you flip that switch and say, come get me, God. I can't do this anymore. This has failed I don't know where we messed up. It's not going to work. I'm not willing to do this. But Jesus hung there for who? He hung there for you. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. The sin The anguish he's feeling for sin, we don't understand. There are things we do in life where we feel guilty, right? We feel like we've messed up. But at the end of time, when the wicked are calling for rocks to fall on their heads, that is the anguish Christ was feeling. That separation from his Father. I'm going to reread that. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when the mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Christ thought he may not make it out of the grave. And if by chance he did, the guilt of sin would be so great that the separation, the distance that was causing him pain would be eternal. Was his sacrifice at this great cost even going to be enough to save man? This pain, this suffering Jesus couldn't see going away. Friends, it's all about his love for you. The greatest love story we have ever known, Jesus' love for you. We are told that the heavenly host had to veil their face from the horror. That nature here on earth expressed its sympathy and the sun even refused to shine. Darkness overtook the cross. 
And in that darkness that God himself came down with his angels and they gathered around the cross. God's desire was to be close to his son. Had his glory flashed out from within the clouds, we're told that every human beholder would have died. However, in the gloom of sin, Christ was not comforted by his Father's presence. He felt still utterly alone, covered in sin. You know, it's true with us that sometimes sin drives us, makes us feel distant from God. But even when we feel distant from God, he is right there with you in the midst of it all. The hands of Jesus that healed the sick, the feet that walked on water are now nailed to the cross. Drips of blood are flowing down his face. Yet it is in the face of his father, now hidden by sin, he longs to see. Thank you. The burden of our sins rack him with guilt. He, the sin bearer, endures the wrath of divine justice and for thy sake becomes sin itself. Jesus, our king, is not able to see his way through. Yet he takes the crown of thorns anyway. He takes your sins to give you a way back to God. The price of Jesus has been paid at an eternal cost. And friends, there is no refund. Jesus paid. And the choice is yours. Are you going to accept that already paid for gift? The gift that was paid at an eternal cost. Luke 23, 46 and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Desire of Ages 756. Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs of the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his father's acceptance heretofore given. Did you get that? He had relied upon the evidence of his father's acceptance heretofore to given him. He was acquitted with the character of his father. He understood his justice, his mercy, and his great love. And by faith, he rested in him whom it had ever been his joy to obey. And as in submission he committed himself to God, and the sense of loss of his father's favor was withdrawn, by faith Christ was the victor. Do you get it? Sin weighed him down. Satan tempted him and said, there is no way. This sin is too great. The Father will never accept what you're doing. And if he does, you're not coming back. You're forever separated. And Christ comes to the point where he relied upon the evidence of his Father's acceptance. He knew the Father's character. And he said, I'm, I'm going to rely on that. That's it. That's all I need. And we are told, by faith, Christ was the victor. Friends, there is an immensely important understanding for us in that. You know, there's times where we hear, I feel this. I feel that. We stand only by the word of God. Not how we feel. Satan can trick our emotions. He tricked Christ's emotions for a point. He felt alone. God was right there. In the midst of Jesus' suffering, 
His father was right there. And Jesus ended up saying, I can't trust how I feel. I'm going to rely upon the evidence of my father's acceptance. I know his character, his mercy, his great love. I'm going to give it to him. And through that, Christ was victor. Amen? Now, how many times have you felt alone? Has sin dragged you down? Friends, our Savior felt that. Jesus was more alone than you and I can ever imagine. And yet, in that moment, was he worried about him? Friends, he was worried about you. He wanted to make sure he had a path for you to get out. He was willing to die regardless of what it meant for him. His question, Father, is my sacrifice enough? It was faith in God is what made Jesus the victor. Everything Jesus felt and saw made him feel alone. There was no way out. He would never make it, yet he finished for you. He put his faith in God's character. Now, do you have that faith? Church, I personally want to give him more of my faith every day. Let us all put more faith in God trusting in him as Jesus did. Even when we feel alone or like there is no way out of this. Have you ever had that prayer? Father, why? Why me? I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to make it. This isn't fair. Think of Jesus. Was there anything fair about what he did? He saw no way out. Yet he chose you. Do you choose him? Now as we go into communion today, let us continue to reflect on the love Christ had for each of us. Think of this great gift of salvation. He could have come down from the cross at any time and said, you know what, this isn't worth it. The worst that Satan could do Jesus endured at the cross. That eternal bond between Father and Son was seemingly broken because of the enormity of our sin. Yet Jesus triumphed for you. He is doing all he can for you. So throughout communion, let us continue to reflect on this great gift. Let us reflect on the service as we do foot washing. Let us reflect on the blood, the all-covering blood that washes away our sins and the body that was broken for you. Now, as we leave, it's important just because we've switched some things around. Men are in the junior Sabbath school class. Women are in the library. And couples and families are in the fellowship hall. I would ask that we keep a spirit of contemplation. That as we come back in, that it's not a time of boisterous jesting and jokes, but a time of reflection on this gift, on this love, on this gift that Jesus has given for you. We'll come back together here after we do the ordinance of humility. Día. That you continue to reflect on him. <coughs> que continuemos al reflejarnos en él. The one who gave everything. El que nos dio todo. For you. Todo para nosotros. At the end, there will also be a collection at the door for our benevolent fund. También al salir habrá una canasta para donar a los pobres un fondo de los and, and I'm not going to make a big deal of that at the end. I just want to continue that reflective time.
time. Y no voy a decir nada acerca de eso después, solamente ahora para reflejar en lo que vamos a hacer en este momento. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Primera de Corintios, capítulo 11, versículos 23 al 26. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. Porque yo recibí del Señor lo que también os he enseñado, que el Señor Jesús, la noche que fue entregado, tomó pan. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. Y habiendo dado gracias, lo partió y dijo, Tomad, comed, esto es mi cuerpo que por vosotros es partido. Haced esto en memoria de mí. In the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Asimismo, tomó también la copa después de haber cenado, diciendo, Esta copa es el nuevo pacto en mi sangre. Haced esto todas las veces que la bebieres en memoria de mí. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Así pues, todas las veces que comieres este pan y bebieres esta copa, la muerte del Señor anunciáis hasta que Él venga. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, Padre nuestro, bien precioso en los cielos. You think about the symbolism involved in the bread. Contemplamos el simbolismo que está contenido en este pan. Bread represents you, the word that has come down from heaven, that came Rep down from heaven for us. Representa a ti, Señor, el verbo, el pan que descendió del cielo para nosotros. Without that word, we wouldn't know which way to go. Sin ese verbo, esa palabra, no supiéramos a dónde irnos. Also, representing you, the broken bread represents your body, which was broken for us. We give thanks, Lord, for this. También este pan que es rota representa tu cuerpo que fue roto por, nos, por nosotros y te agradecemos por esto. Please bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Por favor, bendícenos en el nombre de Jesús. Amén. Amén. Padre nuestro que estás en los cielos. Heavenly Father. Gracias te damos por la oportunidad de participar de este de esta ceremonia. Thank you, Father, for giving us the opportunity for being able to participate in this ceremony. Y gracias porque podemos recordar en esta en este sábado. And thank you, Lord, that we can remember on this Holy Sabbath day la muerte de Jesús por nuestros pecados. The death of Jesus Christ for our sins. Rogamos una bendición por el pan. We ask for a blessing upon this bread. Por lo que ello simboliza. For what they represent, what it represents. Y al comerla. And as we eat it. Podamos confirmar nuestro compromiso contigo that we may confirm our commitment to you nuestro servicio our service y nuestra lealtad oh dios and our reality oh god and our y, loyalty oh god y ojalá que muy pronto querido dios and may it be oh heavenly father podamos verte venir en gloria y majestad may we see you very soon in glory and in majesty en el nombre de Jesús in the name of Jesus amen amen, amen.
And when he had given thanks, y habiendo dado gracias, he break it lo and partió y dijo, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Tomad, comed, esto es mi cuerpo que por, por vosotros es partido. Haced esto en memoria. And after the same manner, Asimismo, he also took the cup. Tomó también la copa. When he had supped, saying, Después de haber cenado, diciendo, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Esta copa es el nuevo pacto en mi sangre. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Haced esto todas las veces que la bebieres en memoria de mí. Stand as with me as we sing hymn three. Por favor, párense mientras cantemos. 